Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Savvy Cast. This is Jamie, and I'm grateful to all of you who are joining, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast. I'm very thrilled today to talk about a topic that Zane and I both are extremely passionate about and an organization that has our full support, and that is First Liberty Institute. First Liberty is the largest legal organization dedicated exclusively to defending everyone's religious liberty, whether you have a faith or no faith. Kelly Shackelford is the president and CEO and chief counsel of First Liberty, and he has a team of legal experts defending religious liberty for all Americans, and their win rate is over 90%. He has the nation's best attorneys defending yours and my religious freedom. Today, to talk about religious freedoms and what First Liberty is doing to defend those is First Liberty's Donor Development and Media Outreach Council, Matt Krause. Matt's currently finishing his fifth term in the Texas House of Representatives. Matt has been named a faith and family champion several times by Texas Values, he was founder and co-chairman of the Texas Prayer Caucus and a founder and officer in the Texas Freedom Caucus. Matt was part of the inaugural class at Liberty University School of Law. He graduated magna cum laude. He graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from San Diego Christian College. During that tenure, he was an NAIA All-American Scholar Athlete for the Men's basketball team. Matt is licensed by the State Bar of Texas, and he is here to share with us everything we want to know about First Liberty Institute. So I would love to welcome to the Savvy Cast, Matt Kraus. Matt, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Cast. I'm thrilled that you're here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, Matt, I cannot wait to dive into our topic, but the icebreaker question everyone has to ask is, what would you choose as your last meal? Oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, it'd probably have to be, I'm a, I'm a Texan, I'm a, I'm a true Texan, and so chicken fried steak is probably my favorite meal. So uh, chicken wow. fried steak, a baked potato, I'm trying to think of what else I would put with that, but as long as I had a good chicken fried steak and a baked potato along with some Dr. Pepper, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably uh, going to meet my savior pretty happy. That's awesome. That's the first time I've had chicken fried steak, but yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> okay, well, Matt, I, I want you to explain to everyone watching or listening what First Liberty stands for and how important it is to every single American, whether you have a religious faith or not. And I just want to preface this by saying before you dive into this is I found out or learned more about First Liberty about two years ago. Kelly Shackelford was here in Birmingham speaking and a group of us went and my husband was there and Right before he finished, I turned to my husband and I said, pull out the checkbook. <laughs> and, the, and he was like, oh, I already have. We were astounded by what First Liberty is doing for us, for everyone. And we were like, we cannot support them fast enough. So just enlighten yeah. all of us, those who may not be aware. Well, thank you for that. And again, thank you for your support. We couldn't do what we do without generous individuals uh, like you and your husband and others that support the ministry. But First Liberty is the largest uh, organization in the country that deals exclusively with fighting for and defending religious liberty. And so in courtrooms and in cases all across America, First Liberty is standing in the gap to protect and defend those religious freedoms. Now, you brought up a great point. Most of the times, a lot of our clients are uh, Christians, Protestant Christians. And people say, well, what if I'm not a Christian? What if I'm Jewish? What if I'm Muslim? What if I'm of a different faith or no faith at all? Why should I care? And we always tell folks, first of all, First Liberty will represent you even if you're uh, of a different religion. Uh, Sikhs, Hindus, others that First Liberty is uh, 
is represented because religious liberty for one group should be religious liberty for all groups. Everybody in America should have the ability to worship uh, as they see fit. James Madison had a great quote, one of our founding fathers. He says, religion is the duty we owe to our creator and our manner of discharging it. So it should be up, open to every American if there is a creator, if you think there's a creator, the duty you owe to that creator and how you go about discharging that obligation. First Liberty wants to stand in the gap for those religious liberties in every uh, conceivable context. Even if you're not a religious person, it's important for you to have religious freedom defended in America because we've said time and again, and you see that in throughout civilization, the history of the world, when you lose religious liberty, when you lose religious freedom, all your other freedoms are at stake as well. And so even if you're not a religious person, you should be very invested in making sure that the rights of those who are religious and your freedom of conscience, even though you may not be religious, you have freedom of conscience, freedom uh, to do and say what you want to do and say, uh, whether it's religious or not. That's the importance of it. And so First Liberty is standing in that gap every day, protecting not only our clients' religious liberty rights, but for everybody else in America as well. Well, Matt, one thing that I want you to explain that I found very intriguing is the way you are structured in the different states. It's not just, you know, one big organization that just goes to the Supreme Court and argues cases there. Can you explain the attorneys and where they're placed and how that works for cases that may have to travel all the way to the Supreme Court. That's right. And, and it's a testament to the brilliance of our founder uh, and CEO, Kelly Shackelford, and also his humility. Uh, because in most every other organization around the country, you have uh, a stable of lawyers and they'll go out into Montana or Arizona or Maine or Florida, wherever the case is taking place and they will litigate those cases. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just been the traditional model for a long time. But Kelly had the idea, said, hey, what if we have a case in Florida and we don't take our first liberty attorneys where we don't have anybody, but we use an affiliate attorney in Florida who already knows the judge, who already knows the courtroom, who already knows those people in that community uh, to advocate on our behalf. And so because of that, we've taken several cases up to the Supreme Court. We just had one a couple of weeks ago that I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. But when First Liberty goes to the Supreme Court or goes into the Fifth Circuit or the Eighth Circuit or district courts across the country, Sometimes it's not even a First Liberty attorney arguing, but it's an affiliate attorney who knows that courtroom and that judge better than any of us ever could. And because of that, we're also able to leverage our resources. A lot of time, or most every time, these affiliate attorneys do it pro bono, which means for free. And so they enjoy the ability to use their law degree, their expertise and what they've done to further uh, the kingdom, to further the culture, to do something like that. So Kelly always reminds folks that for every dollar we get in for litigation services, we leverage that about six or seven times with our affiliate attorneys. So we're able to run on a much leaner budget. We're able to be much more effective and efficient than most other groups are. But it's only because we use those affiliate attorneys because they give their time, their talent, and their treasure for the cause, but also because Kelly's willing to do that. He doesn't have to be the guy in front of the Supreme Court making the argument. He allows some of these other guys. First Liberty still gets the win and the victory, but we've done it in a much more efficient, much more effective way that, that really, I think, has set the model for a lot of other groups going forward. Uh, I, I think they should look at utilizing that as well. Well, if there are attorneys watching or listening who believe in your cause, and how do you become, do you just... Yes, please call us and we can get you the information. Go to firstliberty.org. You'll see our number there. Just call in and say, hey, I'm, I'm an attorney in whatever state, uh, city and state you're at. I would love to be a part of your affiliate attorney network. We'd love to contact you, reach out to you and uh, tell you a little bit more about the program. But yes, we're always looking for good affiliate attorneys because you never know when a case is going to pop up or where, where it's going to pop up. So having uh, folks in our queue to call on if we need their help would be uh, incredibly beneficial. Well, I'm, and I believe I said this in my intro, your, the team of First Liberty attorneys, the win rate is 90%. That's astounding. <laughs> and right. is that also at the Supreme Court level? That, uh, in fact, I'm not sure Kelly and First Liberty have lost a case at the Supreme Court. I could be wrong, but I think it's even higher than 90% at the Supreme Court. But that takes into account all of our cases at every point. And so, and that's only including the cases we take to litigation. Kelly and our entire litigation team will tell you 
there's a lot of cases that we win, that we resolve, that we settle, that we get that, that we get the win for our client before it even goes to litigation. And so that's only 90 percent of the cases that go to litigation. I would say 90, 85 to 90 percent of the time we don't even have to get there. We get the result requested by our client and some good outcome. So First Liberty is uh, and I've only been with them since September, so I can't take any credit for this, uh, but they have done an amazing job for two decades winning about 90% of their cases for two decades, which is virtually unheard of. Well, can you tell us, um, Zane and I were, we were able to have dinner recently with Kelly and several of the staff from First Liberty. And Kelly was sharing with us some information. In my mind, I I understand it, but not well enough to re-articulate it for those, the legal terminology, but he was sharing with us some recent precedents which he never thought would be overturned in his lifetime. And you you know of which I'm speaking. Can you share a little bit about that? It's so exciting to me. That's right. So, you know, uh, the Supreme Court has kind of ebbed and flowed over the last several decades, really over the centuries since our country uh, has been in existence. Um, but around the 1960s, 1970s, the Supreme Court started taking kind of a hostile approach to public displays of religion uh, and even religious expression, religious faith. There were certainly lots of victories since the 60s and 70s, but three big precedents. It's called the Smith case. You also have TWA versus Hardison. And then you had Lemon v. Kurtzman, uh, which gave us in 1971 what's called the Lemon Test. And all three of these cases have been used by the courts, by folks on the other side, to inhibit and prohibit public displays of religion. That is until uh, First Liberty got involved with some of these cases. In 2019, First Liberty was representing the Bladensburg Peace Cross in Maryland. Uh, and this it was, a, it was a World War I memorial cross that was up in an intersection. And some people were offended that they had to look at a cross all the time. So they took that to the Supreme Court. And uh, First Liberty is like, no, uh, there's lots of good reasons to have this. But th- this is in no way a, a violation of separation of church and state. It's not constitutionally invalid. The Supreme Court sided with First Liberty, but it was the first time we saw the little chink in the armor of the Lemon Test. Now, the Lemon Test was from 1971. The Supreme Court made up this convoluted three-pronged test to say whether a public display of religion could go or whether it could stay. And just a real quick example of uh, how crazy it is, in 2005, two different Ten Commandments displays were in front of the Supreme Court, one from Texas, outside our Capitol grounds. We have a huge Ten Ten Commandments display, and then one in Kentucky at at a county commissioner courthouse where they just put up a display with the Ten Commandments with a bunch of others. Well, out of those two, you would think they'd get rid of the two-ton monument, uh, granite of the Ten Commandments, and leave the one that's just hanging on a wall, some other uh, documents. But no, the Lemon Test upheld uh, the Texas Ten Commandments display and struck down the Kentucky Ten Commandments display. So two displays on the same day with the same court came to a different solution because of this convoluted test. So getting rid of the lemon test or having that overruled has been a goal of religious liberty, constitutional litigation experts for decades. Never thought that the court would revisit that until 2019 when First Liberty had that Peace Cross case. And the court first started saying, you know what, maybe we ought to revisit the lemon test because it's so convoluted. Fast forward to 2022 with uh, the Kennedy decision. If you remember that, Coach Kennedy was the coach, high school coach that just wanted to kneel at the 50-yard line and pray after every game, just thanking God for the opportunity to be involved in these guys' lives and all that kind of stuff. And so he did that. And his district court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, no, you can't do that. Finally, it made its way up to the Supreme Court after seven years. The Supreme Court said, no, you have every right to pray after the game, kneel on a 50-yard line, even if it's at a school function, you have the right to do that, which was great. So we we were thrilled that we got that victory for our client, Coach Kennedy. But also in that opinion, even more uh, consequential is they overruled the lemon test. And they said, you know what? This test has outlived its usefulness. We're no longer going to use this. What we're going to use now is a history and tradition test. And so we like to tell folks the Kennedy case did for religious liberty what the Dobbs case did for the pro-life community. If you remember the Dobbs case that same summer in 2022, got rid of Roe v. Wade, something that pro-life activists had tried for decades to get rid of. Never thought you might see the day, but it finally, uh, Dobbs finally overruled Roe v. Wade. Kennedy finally overruled the Lennon test. And so it just opened up the doors wide open uh, for now new public displays of religion. This year, First Liberty again, had another case at the Supreme Court in the Groff case, 
where Gerald Groff is an employee of the United States Postal Service. He never wanted to work on Sundays. He never wanted to, uh, he always wanted to go to church. And so he got a job with the Postal Service because they didn't work on Sundays. Well, then Amazon and Jeff Bezos said, hey, we want to pay you to deliver our packages on Sundays too. And so uh, his employer started scheduling him for work. And he kept saying, I need a religious accommodation because that's that's very important to me. And that's the whole reason I went to work the post office anyway. Well, that case made it all the way up to Supreme Court. First Liberty argued that just a couple months ago. We expect a ruling in June that will say Gerald Groff should have been given that religious accommodation. And we think that that case might also overturn that second of the cases that I talked about, TWA versus Hardison. We think that might get overturned as well, which will open up the floodgates for uh, private employees uh, to reassert their, their religious rights in the workplace. And so in, in just the next couple of months, you could have limit overturned and you could have TWA overturned, which would only leave one more case, the Smith case. But two of the biggest three hindrances to public displays of religion and religious liberty might be struck down just in the next couple of weeks. Wow. Now, I saw that in Texas, I believe it was this week that it went to the Senate and they said that the Ten Commandments could go in all the schools, but wasn't that hindered by the legislature? Could you speak to that? And is that what we're going to start seeing across the United States? That's right. That's a very real possibility. So because of the lemon test, uh, there was a case in 1980 called Stone v. Graham, and it was out of Kentucky. And uh, the Kentucky legislature said, let's put up a copy of the Ten Commandments in every classroom in our public schools in Kentucky. The court struck that down and said, no, that's unconstitutional. But they used the lemon test, uh, which is no longer valid law. And so Senator Phil King here in Texas did a great job and said, you know what? That's no longer valid law. The sole basis for saying Ten Commandments can't be in our public schools is because of the lemon test. Well, that's no there any longer. The new test is history and tradition. There's hardly any document that has more history and tradition in American law than the Ten Commandments. And so he filed a bill, Senate Bill 1515, to restore the Ten Commandments to every uh classroom in Texas. It made it through the Senate. Unfortunately, it just died in the House two days ago at the House bill deadline. It was on the calendar, but they didn't get to it. So in Texas, we meet 140 days every two years. And once that bill deadline hits, then you have to wait another uh, basically 18 months to reintroduce that legislation. So I fully expect Senator King and maybe Representative Candy Noble, who had it in the House, to refile that legislation. But you're exactly right. That shows kind of the momentous shift in law because of that Kennedy decision and getting rid of the limit test. We would encourage uh, every state to start looking at some kind of Ten Commandments law um, and call First Liberty because we were very involved in that Senate Bill 1515. And we'd love to talk with you about it as well. If you have any listeners who are either in the legislature, work for the legislature, either in Alabama or any other state, uh, we'd love to talk to you about that because we would love to see uh, more of these things take place, more of these type bills. We were hoping Texas could have kind of set the standard but at least you got the conversation going and hopefully other states will pick it up from here. Well, Matt, other than just displaying the Ten Commandments, what are some other things that because of this lemon law being overturned, what are some other things that people might say, OK, now we are going to do X, Y or Z or we're going to try to do that? That's right. And so and that's a great question. And that's why we've started this entire campaign called Restoring Faith in America. Um, the lemon test had been used about six to seven thousand times, six or seven thousand times since 1971 to inhibit public displays of religion. Kelly's kind of grand idea was to say, hey, let's go back and try to do as uh, reverse as many of those bad decisions as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but it's even more of a grassroots effort. So anybody listening to you right now can go to RFIA.org, stands for Restoring Faith in America. Dot org, rfia.org. And what you can do is you can read up on how you can restore, restore faith in America. Maybe that's calling your school board member and saying, hey, why don't we start praying at the beginning of every one of our meetings or your county commissioners? How about we start prayer again as well? Because for a long time, some of these prayers in these county commissioner courts, school board meetings, city council meetings had been inhibited because they were afraid that it was going to be struck down as unconstitutional. What no, about you football can't. games, prayer before football public Okay. That's right. That's right. Football games. You, or you any any sports. That, so yeah. now if some if a if someone at a school says we we want to pray before this game, there's no one that can stop them technically because there's no they, legislature or whereas in the te the Texas situation that had to go through the both houses. 
That, that, that's exactly right. And, but now you don't have that convoluted lemon test. You just have, is it part of the history and tradition? Well, we've had a history and tradition of public prayer, again, since the founding of our country, right? Thomas Jefferson, when he was the president of the Senate, when he was the vice president, was the one who authorized funds to be used to bring in a chaplain using federal tax dollars to hire a chaplain at the very outset of our uh, new constitution and new government. And so public prayer has been seen for a long time as part of just the history and tradition of America. So like you said, whether it's public events, city council meetings, school board meetings, we've talked about to folks, uh, different governmental entities about putting those 10 commandments displays back up at their courthouse grounds, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a city, Elkhart, Indiana, I think again in the 1980s, that had one of those big monuments that was taken down because of the lemon test. And so we've been talking with various folks saying, hey, how about sponsoring one of these Ten Commandments displays and putting that back out there? So there are so many things that you can do that you had not been able to do before. And again, rfia.org will give you a a lot of ideas. And then if, if your city councilman, your school board member, your legislator runs into roadblocks, have them call us. If you call them and say, hey, I want you to put prayer back into our uh, city council meetings. And they're like, well, I need some guidance on how to do that. Call First Liberty. We'd love, we've already done that with several folks. We'd love to walk you through your options, how you can do that, uh, what you might want to consider as you're doing that. Um, But we'd love for people to this to be a grassroots effort where you have millions of people across America looking for ways in their community And First Liberty can't do all that ourselves, nor would we want to do that ourselves. We think that uh, having Americans all across the country, who knows, it could generate another revival, but we're getting uh, our our faith back out there. And we think, think that that's a very good thing. Well, see, I think this is wonderful. This is something anyone can do. Maybe you're retired, maybe you're an empty nest mom, and you just want to make a difference. And I asked Kelly when he was explaining this to us, I said, okay, we have these new freedoms because of this overturned um, lemon law, but no one knows about it. He says, that's the problem. We have to let everyone know, hey, this door is open. You can walk through, but that's the RFIA.org. That's what that's there for. And then you all are there and you say you've already been walking people through different processes. Is it all pretty much related to the Ten Commandments or what are some other things y'all are saying? Uh, Again, it's prayers. We've talked to city prayers. councilmen. We've talked to county commissioners. We've talked to school board members. We've talked to legislators in Idaho and Arkansas and other places that are trying to put in legislation that uh, modeled after the Coach Kennedy decision from the Supreme Court. We've got an upcoming uh, conference with the National Association of Christian Lawmakers uh, in Virginia next month, where we're going to be giving them a lot of the tools as well that we've already been talking with some of them. So it, it's it's all these kinds of different things, all these different areas. And what we love about it is so often... We're on the defense, right? We're reactive. Uh, if somebody tries to take away our rights, we're, we're trying to defend them. Here's one area where we can actually be proactive and we can actually go on the offense and say, hey, we're not going to wait around. We're, we're going to go uh, be proactive and try to get our public displays of religion back into the public square because we can. And that's given so much confidence and encouragement and excitement to folks because they understand so many times we hear the negative things. It's always negative, negative, negative. Well, we've had some huge wins on the religious liberty side. We're about to have another one. And let's go on offense and let's be uh, aggressive in defending and advocating for our rights in the public square. That's what we're able to do here. And that's what gets us really excited. Well, I I know you have got a tight schedule and I'm about to wind this up, but I do want to ask, of course, we love supporting First Liberty and um, are passionate about it. For those who might be kicking the tires about it, what, where does the money go? I mean, you've got lawyers, a pro bono, what does their money go toward when they give to First Liberty? That, that, that's a great question. We're blessed with the CFO uh, named Dave Holmes, who uh, oh, worked on Wall he Street. At, he was at dinner with us that night. Oh, He's yeah. brilliant. Former yes. fighter pilot. Uh, he he, he yes. was a top gun, right? Uh, former yeah. fighter pilot. But he's also worked with J.P. Morgan, uh, some of the top investment banks in the world, run large banks. He's so financially sophisticated. And I, we were actually just on a call a couple, uh, couple of days ago, and he was telling the whole team how we run things and how we want to be good stewards of the resources that God gives you. And so uh, you can look at the 990 forms that are out there publicly available for a lot of nonprofits. You will find, I think, uh, again, I'm biased, but I think you will find First Liberty does more with less than anybody else in the country. And so when you give to First Liberty, it's going to pay uh, attorneys who are, could be earning 
two, three, four, maybe five times more in uh, outside of uh, First Liberty if they went into private practice. Brilliant attorneys, great pedigrees who know exactly what they're doing. Uh, it goes to pay their salaries and their support staff salaries uh, and other folks that make First Liberty run. But everybody does it. You take a little bit of a discount sometimes at First Liberty because you're doing it for the cause. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, we're able to get top shelf talent who's doing first class work and doing it for a fraction of the cost that, that some other uh, entities are able to do it for. That's because everybody believes in the cause and the Lord has allowed us to stretch our money beyond what most organizations are able to do. So you can be very confident that if you go to firstliberty.org and you donate, that your money is going to be used wisely, it's going to be used efficiently, and it's going to be used effectively as the top religious liberty organization in the country to make sure we defend the values that are very important to you. Mm, I can't think of a better place outside of your tithe and, and your, your church to, to give. Amen. And so I do encourage everyone, look into First Liberty. And, and other than the podcast, you have a new podcast now, you have an Instagram, but First Liberty, the, the website, all of the different ways that you can learn about First Liberty will be on the show notes. And Matt, thank you. Thank you for sharing all of this. And thank you for all that all of you do at First Liberty. I'm, I'm just so grateful. Well, thank you for having us on. As we talked about, we can have the greatest message in the world, but if we don't get it out to the people, it doesn't do us much good. So you're playing a huge role in that. Thank you for allowing us to, uh, to talk to your listeners and viewers today about it. Uh, we're honored to have folks like you and your husband partnered with us in this ministry. Uh, we're so excited about the future of our country, of religious liberty in America, but it's only because of folks like y'all. And as a, as a team together, uh, we can make sure we're restoring faith in America. And I think that'll bring a lot of added benefits for our entire country, not just for those who are supporting First Liberty. Wonderful. Matt, thank yeah. you so very much. You are always welcome to come back anytime. Sounds great. I'd love to. God bless you. Thank God you. God bless you as well. Bye-bye.